I'd been working on a Colorado baseball history documentary and had seen hundreds of photos of Bears Stadium, the minor league ballpark in Denver. Unrelated, my mom found a scrapbook of her grandpa Jojo Vitter's baseball career. Looking through it, we found pictures of him at Bears Stadium posing with major league ball players. Jojo played Texas league ball, but really only talked about it when another one of his teammates had died. We didn't understand the photos, and I started trying to put the story together. Zooming way in on a photo led to the connection between the two histories. The search of one story led to another. When Joe Vitter was born in 1911, he joined an ongoing story of baseball in his family. His dad, Frank, who was known as Top, played, as well as Top's brothers, Jack, Harry, Paul, and Jimmy. Their sister Loretta played, and she was married to Oyster Joe Martina, then the champion baseball thrower of the world. Martina's sister was also an award-winning thrower. Baseball connected the family. Top Vitter met his wife Vivian Druyette while playing on the Generette team with her brother. They were married in late 1910 and had Joe shortly after. As Joe later said, everybody in my family but the cat has played professional baseball and I just followed. Jojo and his brother Drew played for St. Anthony's School and started playing semi-pro ball as soon as they could. In 1924, Jojo's uncle and godfather, Oyster Joe, finally made it to the bigs and was a World Series champ with Washington. He returned to New Orleans the next year. Joe's uncle Jimmy managed a team called the Green Leafs that included Joe, brother Drew, and cousin Buzz. Though they were young, baseball was extremely serious business. In 1926, a feud was started by a player who had been cut from the Green Leafs, George Moore. The next spring, Moore challenged Buzz Vitter to a fight. Moore brought his father and brother along. Buzz brought his uncles Top and Jimmy. The fight turned into a brawl and other family members joined in. Pipes, lead balls, chains, and rocks were used. It ended with Moore's father, Ignatius, shooting Jimmy Vitter in the heart. Ignatius, Top, and Joe were all treated at Charity Hospital for fractured skulls or head injuries. Jimmy's mother was devastated. He was dead at 32. Baseball and family both took on new meaning. The Vitter family stuck together after the tragedy. Here, playing in 1930, is Joe with his dad Top, brother Mickey, his cousins Buzz, Carl, and Joey Martina. The next year, the team added brother Drew. In 1932, Joe was listed as a prep star alongside future New Orleans Pelican, Larry Gilbert Jr. The next two years, Joe played summer and winter leagues in Generette, New Iberia, and Morgan City. Sundays were often semi-pro games. This one featured Joe's dad, Top, and Uncle Bub, and Oyster Joe Martina. The youngster team included Joe, his brothers Drew and Mickey, and his cousin Joey Martina. By 1934, Joe was playing in Canton, Mississippi, Going five for five in a game caught the attention of the Pine Bluff judges, and they brought him up in early July. Joe stayed with the team in 1935, holding out for $85 per month. That season, he played against his younger brother Drew, then with the Greenville Buckshots. Joe ended up making the East Dixie League All-Star team and hitting 327 for the season. Before the season was over, Joe was sold to the Chicago Cubs for $1,000. His replacement in Pine Bluff was his cousin, Joey Martina. The youngest fitter brother, Mickey, was getting attention as well. He was to get a tryout with Greenville, the same team middle brother Drew had played with. After playing another winter in New Orleans, Joe went way west, all the way to Catalina Island. William Wrigley owned the island, and the Cubs had spring training there for three decades, starting in 1921. Joe reported there February of 1936 alongside Charlie Grimm, Billy Herman, and others. He injured his right arm, his throwing arm, then impressed the trainer by throwing with his left arm. Unfortunately, a ball hit by his friend, Frank Demery, took a bad hop and busted Joe's lip. The photo made the news, and Joe was made into a headline as the first Cub casualty. Though he wasn't cut, it couldn't have made a good impression. Soon after, the team went on an exhibition tour en route to Florida, Jojo played against Pittsburgh's Paul Wehner and Boston's Lefty Grove and Jimmy Fox. Then, Jojo got a hit against the New York Giants and a major league pitcher, either Al Smith or Dick Kaufman. 
Also playing for New York, future Hall of Famer from Gretna, Mel Ott, who homered in that game. Spring training ended for Joe at the haunted Tutwiler Hotel in Birmingham, Alabama, where Charlie Grimm gave some fatherly advice to four players. He laid it on thick and told them he expected to see them the next spring. He paid their way to the farm club in Portsmouth, Virginia. Joe's cup of coffee, as he called it later, was over. He kept on and played well for the Portsmouth Cubs in 1936, filling in at various positions. Meanwhile, Brother Drew was on a streak playing for Cleveland, Mississippi. He went four for four, then five for five. At the end of the season, he was sold to Little Rock of the Southern Association. However, during a winter ball game in Bunky, Louisiana, he slid into second and broke both bones in his left leg. The doctor didn't set it properly, and Drew spent the next 15 weeks in a hospital fighting infections and then appendicitis. Friends and family set up benefit games for him to offset the health costs. Pelican's manager, Larry Gilbert Sr., and Drew's dad, Top Vitter, presented a check. Though he kept the leg, Drew would never play again and would walk with a limp. Youngest Vitter brother, Mickey, stayed in New Orleans and played indoor baseball, winning the championship with family friends. At the end of the season with Portsmouth, Joe finished second in a popularity contest for the first of several times. Then, Joe was traded to the San Francisco Seals. Batting after Dom DiMaggio, Vitter played well, but in April, he was traded to the Seals' crosstown rivals, the Mission Reds. In September, Vitter would play against San Diego and a very young Ted Williams. The Mission Reds would turn into the Hollywood stars, but Joe didn't figure into the team. In early 1938, Joe's grandmother died and he returned to Louisiana. His uncles, Jack and Harry, had died in the past five years and the family was changing. His own life was also about to change. Nearly all of Joe's family played some form of baseball. Almost 40 years earlier, his uncles Druyette and McKay played with his dad and uncle and family friend Bob Tarleton. In 1938, Tarleton was business manager of the Texas League's Shreveport Sports and brought Joe Vitter back to his home state by purchasing his rights from the Hollywood Stars. As with every team, Joe Vitter was Shreveport's utility fielder, playing every position except for pitcher and catcher. Smart play, hustle, and crafty base running were his traits. In his first year in the Texas League, he made the All-Star team. He was also runner-up for most popular player and was awarded his first of several watches as consolation prizes. Shreveport started the 1939 season by drawing 6,000 fans to see them play an exhibition game against Mel Ott and the New York Giants. Ott had a triple. Vitter responded with a homer. At the end of 1939, JoJo was given another watch for finishing second in popularity. More significant for me, he had the votes of my grandma Jerry, short for Geraldine, and her mom Bessie. In 1940, Joe started off hot, going 5 for 5 April 8th, then on April 25th getting 4 hits and 4 RBI. He made the All-Star team again, and was once again eclipsed as the most popular player at the end of the season. The next year would be better. On April 10th, 1941, Joe married Bessie and a new chapter opened in their lives. She was stylish and confident and would forever change Joe's life. Bessie and Jerry began a scrapbook, capturing and clipping moments of his career. In July, he was hitting 326 and was named the All-Star team again. Due to the efforts of some fans, probably Bessie and Jerry, Shreveport held a Vitter Appreciation Night on August 28. The life change also made Joe consider his value. And after the 1941 season, he considered leaving baseball for the security of full-time work at the plant. After a negotiation period, he returned to the utility role for Shreveport for the 1942 season. Again, he provided defensive insurance and clutch hitting for the team. The team got hot, and for the first time, Shreveport were Texas League champs. Being the veteran, Joe posed with a novelty bat from the previous city championship of 1919. Though he's offered a spot on the 1943 team, Joe was again uncertain about returning to baseball with a secure job at the plant and Bessie and Jerry to take care of. The ongoing war took the Shreveport option away. On the same day that Joe DiMaggio volunteered for service, Shreveport folded and all players were sold to the St. Paul Saints of the AA American Association. Joe's Shreveport teammate, Salty Parker, was named manager and asked Vitter to go with him. Vitter didn't report in April, 
but Parker continued to try to persuade him. In May of 1943, newspapers reported that Vitter had decided to call it a career. As expected from someone born into baseball, leaving the game wouldn't be easy. Although the Shreveport sports were sold due to the war, a new victory league was started in their place, and Joe Vitter was hired to manage and play on the AFO team. The money was better in Minnesota, but he didn't want to leave Bessie, who was enjoying her time and social group in Shreveport. She had a lot of success with her bowling team in this era. In St. Paul, Salty Parker continued writing to try to persuade Vitter to play for his Saints. Likely, Bob Tarleton influenced the decision yet again. Tarleton, the GM that hired Vitter in Shreveport, was now GM for the Saints, and he must have enticed Joe with more because Joe joined the Saints halfway through the 1943 season. In front of a new team and new fans, Joe again showed his clever play, hustle, speed, and versatility. 1944 was even better. His average ballooned to 370, and he made the all-star team again, his first time in the American Association. Newspaper coverage had increased in the new city, and photographers often included Vitter in their action shots. This double steal was shown from two angles in two newspapers. Attendance was very good, this photo shows how much fan interaction has changed. In 1947, Bob Tarleton again hired Joe Vitter, this time for 600 per month. In May, Joe was offered a managing job in the Dodgers farm system by Branch Rickey. Joe turned it down, citing Bessie's health problems. He's released outright for the first time in his career. Dejected, he signed with the Atlanta Crackers of the Southern Association in early June. By July, he's ejected from a game and released. He signed with DeLand, Florida, and goes on a 27-game hitting streak. In 1948, he's hired to manage the team. Though he hit well, he's released in June again and signed with Daytona Beach. He battles for the batting title for the rest of the season. Though he was on top at 352, he eventually finished at 319. In early 1949, his daughter Jerry and husband Jim Rasmussen had their first child and named him Jimmy Joe. Joe and Bessie relocated to Denver to be grandparents. In the spring of 1949, Joe accepted his final managing job in Jenkins, Kentucky. Bessie and Joe's parents all visited Jenkins. Joe even included his dad in a team photo. In 1950, Joe returned to where it all started. He played one more season in New Orleans with friends and former teammates. Back in Colorado, Joe and Bessie became grandparents again and helped raise my mom. Joe did baseball clinics and worked to bring softball to Denver. In 1953, just days after winning the World Series as a Yankee, Joe's former teammate, Eddie Lopat, brought a barnstorming team to Colorado, then Hawaii and Japan. At the game in Denver, Joe reconnected with Lopat, with players he knew from the Bay Area, Jackie Jensen and Billy Martin, and with some old playing buddies from New Orleans, Lou Cretlow, Mel Parnell, and Dave Philly. Life slowed down and Joe worked at Gates Rubber Factory in Denver for the next several decades. In 1973, he was inducted into the Diamond Club Hall of Fame here in New Orleans. His brother Mickey attended in his place. In 1977, a heart attack took Bessie and Joe was never again the same fun-loving man that he had been. He remained close with his daughter Jerry and her growing family in Denver, teaching my sister and I how to play baseball. In 1995, he passed on. When he had talked about his life in baseball, he would look at his old team photos and point out everyone that was dead. I'm so thankful to have his scrapbook and to have researched more about his career in order to bring some of that life back. <laughs> 